moment to look around and note the fire exit nearest to you. In the event of an emergency, please follow the instructions given by staff. Please switch your electronic devices to silent mode now. And if you wish to tweet about tonight's event, the hashtag is PQT. We have six topic areas this evening and we'll spend up to 20 minutes on each. This is how it works. For each topic, the chairman will take questions from those of you with your hands up. Please wait for a member of staff with a microphone to reach you before you speak. The chairman will take three questions at a time and will then direct your questions to the mayor or an assembly member. We have no advance notice of the questions. If you're able to stand to ask your question, the cameras and those on stage will find it easier to see you. Please do keep your questions short so we can get to as many of you as possible. And please ask questions. With so many of you here tonight, obviously we won't have the time to take everyone's question. So if you don't get to ask yours tonight, please give your question to one of the team in the foyer and we'll answer it later. Please also remember to fill in the feedback form and hand it to a member of staff at the end. We'll finish tonight at 9pm sharp. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please put your hands together for your chairman this evening, the Assembly Member for South West, Tony Arbour. Well, they do say that the two most boring words in the English language are local and government. But this evening, because you've braved the elements, uh, it's quite clear that in Hounslow and in South West, local government isn't quite as boring as uh, many people would have you believe. This is the first time that uh, uh, People's Question Time has come to Hounslow. It's taken uh, 17 years, um, and I've no doubt that... Um, we will show the mayor what we think of him. Um, uh, that is via your questions, of course. It's, uh, as I say, very good of you uh, that so many of you have uh, turned out. The function of the mayor and the assembly really is to make uh, uh, life in London better for you. This is your opportunity to check with the mayor that he has actually made life in London better for you. And um, this evening, I shall be very glad to, um, if many of the questions are actually related to the patch. However, it's not me that you'll be asking the questions of, it will be the Mayor and my colleagues from the London Assembly. So would you please welcome the London Assembly members. Now would you welcome the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. <laughs> right, we will be taking questions uh, uh, on the basis of uh, topics. The first topic we will be taking questions on will be transport, and that will be followed by safety. We've already asked you to keep your questions short, so that we can get in as many of you as possible. I will uh, say to you, as I will say to the Mayor and my colleagues, please keep your answers short. We want to get in as many as possible. This is not an occasion for speech making. Uh, I've no doubt you've already switched off your electronic devices, and I would like uh, my colleagues to switch theirs off as well. Uh, but it's important that you hear from someone who is completely objective on these matters, and that is the Chair of the London Assembly, Jeanette Arnold. Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, let me start by thanking you all for coming out on our one of the coldest nights that we've had so far. It's lovely to look around and see um, the population of the area reflected. Welcome all you young people who uh, have come with us tonight and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. And uh, just to say good evening to um, the leader, to um, Mayor, and to um, 
wonderful friend, Seema. Uh, nice to see you. And uh, all the special guests here tonight. Um, and uh, you've got such a special assembly member that can I ask you to put your hands together one more time for him? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I just wanted to use um, the next five minutes just to um, say to you um, a few things about the work that we're doing. Um, uh, we, we all know that last year was a very difficult year for London. And at the Assembly, we have ensured that the issues such as the Grenfell Tower fire, the terror attacks, and big policy issues such as Brexit have featured strongly in our work. Uh, Grenfell Tower fire, we kept a close watch on developments and a number of committees, including the Greater London Assembly Oversight Committee, the Planning Committee, and the Housing Committee have examined the issues leading up to the fire, the response to it, and the likely repercussions. And as we develop these uh, recommendations, what we then do is we actually then uh, send them to the appropriate um, department, individual. Most of our recommendations, you might imagine, are targeted at the mayor. We're always looking for him to do more, to do better, to go higher, um, and uh, to, to do all that he can to make life for Londoners just that bit better. Um, can't speak, can you, as a politician nowadays without mentioning Brexit. So the Assembly has kept up the pressure on the Mayor to ensure that uh, he is representing the issues that matter to London in his conversations with David Davis, uh, one of the government's lead negotiators. And um, uh, we have published a series of Brexit directive letters which have been well received. And what that was about was to ensure that we were picking up the voices from Londoners. We had open meetings with EU citizens, we've spoken to business, we've spoken to um, uh, in people from um, the healthcare workers. And um, a recent letter was published by our Police and Crime Committee and it urged the mayor to press for cl greater clarity on the government's ambitions for law enforcement and justice following Brexit. So many areas that will impact on our lives. Um, so that's what we've been trying to pick up, those areas that we don't hear a lot about. Um, as we know, London has been subject to a range of burst water mains over the last year. And so our Environment Committee has been very active and has really put the pressure on Thames Water and others, changing the, the way they work. And recently, when they came back to us, um, they were able to tell us uh, from the work that we'd done with them in, 19 20 in um, 2016, their response to a recent uh, water mains burst was within 15 minutes they had responded rather than overnight, as they usually do and that they were much more aware of what they needed to do. And most important of all, everybody was talking together, whereas clearly in the past they weren't. Um, just to mention, um, you can't speak again without transport, and members of our transport committee have uh, produced some incredible reports um, looking at the system as it is now, but as importantly, looking towards the future. Um, yesterday, the Economy Committee published its report on the Nighttime Committee, and I've just read it, and it's such a really good document. Because, you know, we forget that in our 24-hour city, there are people who are not paid, um, if you like, the day rate, who have very little protection um, in their jobs, and the services are not there for them. A, a really good uh, report, which we will be exploring um, shortly at our plenary meeting. Um, I just bring you up to date and say this afternoon, we not only um, uh, put pressure on the current mayor, we also hold previous mayors to account. And so um, members of our oversight committee, I won't say they were blessed with his company, because uh, I don't know that they thought it was a blessing, um, but uh, they quite rightly um, summons the former mayor to come in front of them to give further explanations about the millions that was lost on his folly project. And 
I know that uh, many, many people have followed that on Twitter, but it's not a Twitter issue. It's a real concern to Londoners. And what we're saying by this action is we will keep up the pressure on any mayor and we will ask the questions that matter to London. So let me just finish by saying in the year of the 100th anniversary of some women getting the vote, the whole assembly celebrated this amazing achievement with a unanimous motion celebrating the achievement of the women who fought passionately, gave their lives, endured hardship and cruelty at the hands of the state to make it happen for us to be able to go out and put that X against our choice for our political leaders. Let's never forget their sacrifice that they made for us. So we will keep up the work on your behalf and as you've been told earlier, if there are any questions that you don't get asked tonight, send them to your constituency member, that's Tony Arbor, all of them, so, um, but, uh, <laughs> but do um, send them to whichever assembly member you like and we will ensure that they're answered. But um, enjoy tonight and I look forward to hearing your questions and indeed the answers from the Mayor. Thank you very much. Now I'll ask the mayor to be calm to speak for up to five minutes. Well, thank you uh, very much. Th thank you everyone for coming to Hounslow Civic Centre on this bitterly cold evening. It's great to be in the People's Republic of Hounslow tonight. Before I uh, start, can I also thank uh, uh, Assembly Member Tony Arbour, not only for welcoming us here tonight, and the job he's doing representing you on the assembly, but for his work as a councillor since he was first elected in Richmond upon Thames in 1971. I was literally in nappies when Tony was first elected. Remarkably, since People's Question Time first began in 2000, Tony has never missed a single People's Question Time. Let's give Tony a round of applause, please. Can also thank uh, Councillor Steve Curran, the leader of Hounslow Council, the Mayor of Hounslow, she's the one with the bling, uh, and all the other councillors for their hospitality. And also it's good to see uh, the local Member of Parliament, uh, Seema Malhotra, the MP for Feltham and Heston, who's here tonight as well. My ambition is the same today as when I first became the Mayor, for every Londoner to get the opportunities to get on in life that our city gave to me and my family. This means working to, to ensure that our city works for all Londoners and making sure things like investment, transport links, access to culture and opportunities to get on in life are spread across every corner of our city, outer London as well as inner London, zones four and five as well as zones one and two. And I'm working to improve the lives of every Londoner in every borough of our incredible city, including this great borough of Hounslow. I don't have time in my opening remarks to mention all the key initiatives I am working on, so I'm gonna touch on just two key issues. Firstly, policing. I'm working hard every day to keep our city safe. And we've already delivered some major reforms to help tackle crime. This includes restoring real neighborhood policing here in Hounslow and across our city, every ward now has at least two named officers and one community support officer, and also investing much more in youth services to help divert young people in London away from crime. But we still face a massive challenge. Following the deep and sustained cuts over the last eight years by the government to police forces and preventative services, crime is rising across our country, particularly violent crime and particularly burglaries. I'm not willing to stand by when it's the safety of Londoners being put at risk. So I recently took the decision to allocate the Met Police an extra 110 million pounds collected from business rates that would, that would usually be spent elsewhere to make sure we can fund an additional 1,000 police officers. But I've got to be upfront with you. This alone will not reverse the rise in crime we're seeing in London and across the country. It will just enable us to keep our heads above the water. The Met Police will still be 
severely stretched. But I can assure you that I'll keep putting up, I'll, I'll keep putting on pressure to the government to deliver more investment in our police forces and restore funding to the services that provide alternative paths for our young people away from crime. The second issue is housing. The housing crisis is not only contributing to the shocking cost of living in our city, but it's a massive social issue too, causing poverty, health problems, and growing inequality. I've been honest from the start. I can't promise to turn things around overnight, and ultimately, we need more investment from the government to fix this problem that's been decades in the making. But I'm pleased to report that we're starting to make some progress in the right direction. We've increased the number of genuinely affordable homes in the planning system from 13% one three since when before I became mayor to 38% of applications now. We've agreed investment in 50,000 new genuinely affordable homes, including new homes based on social rent levels, council homes. We're helping build uh, and we're helping fund projects with the council, like the housing zone site here at the Civic Center, where work is underway to build more than 900 homes, half of them will be affordable. And we're using all the powers at our disposal to improve the experience of renters in London and to crack down on rogue landlords and foreign buyers using London homes as gold bricks. We've, only, we've got a long way to go, and this is only the beginning. I hope this gives you uh, an idea of how we're tackling these two key issues for our city. And I look forward to answering some of your questions in these two areas later on this evening. And there are other areas from tackling air pollution to supporting culture and encouraging greater social integration. But let me just uh, finish <coughs> with this. There's much more to do. We have made a good start, and I'm determined to keep up the pace of change. You have a bright future here in Hounslow with many talented, ambitious Londoners. It's crucial that we tap into this potential and make sure everyone has a chance to reach their potential. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions this evening. Right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I shall be taking questions in groups of three. The first topic for the next 18 minutes is transport. And you can address your question either to the Mayor or to relevant Assembly members. And we have this evening, we have the Chairman of the Transport Committee and we have representatives from all of the parties. Right, first question please. Lady with the white hair here. Do forgive me if I can't distinguish you properly, the lighting isn't terribly good. Another question, by num where, number five. Can you come to the gentleman with the cheese cutter hat? And over there, lady in the yellow thing. <laughs> yellow top. Wave. I think the man with the paddle can't see you. Okay. Right, madam. Thank you very much. My name's Rula Kuzotis. I'm a resident of this borough. Setting aside for a moment where budgets are held, how can it be right for TfL to spend nearly £70 million on CS9 when it has suffered nearly £1 billion in losses? And how can you, as Mayor, Mr Khan, with so many more challenges being faced today, as you've just mentioned, in housing, health and social care, to name just but three areas, justify this outlay on a cycle superhighway at such a time? Thank, Thank you very much. Another gentleman with the hat. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Smith, a resident of Chiswick High Road and uh, actively involved in social media uh, debate about cycle infrastructure. Um, I understand your transport strategy is ready for consideration in March. It's an excellent strategy um, in Chiswick. We highly approve of putting pedestrians and cyclists first. Um, it says that walking will be prioritised across London streets and they will be more appealing with wider clutter-free pavements. CS9 reduces the width of pavement for about 91% of its route along Chiswick High Road. Um, some of this is minimal, but in numerous stretches, including outside my own home and my business premises, as well as multiple other stretches like the Roman Catholic Church, the pavement will be reduced by two-thirds of its width. 
as this flies in the face of your excellent healthy street strategy, what will you do, Mayor, to stop TfL from taking away vast sections of our space for walking? Thank you very much. And now the lady in the yellow. Um, my name is Samantha Medici. Um, I was <laughs> just wondering, what plans do you have to improve accessibility at underground stations, particularly those in Zone 1 and 2? Right. Mr. Mayor. Well, let me deal with the, the, the first two questions are, are, are linked, although asked in a different way. Uh, uh, I'll talk both of them uh, together. Firstly, I do not apologise for wanting to have more people walking and cycling. And I'm sorry if you're against that. Uh, what I'm in favour of uh, at a time when our population is growing is to encourage more people to walk and cycle. And the second gentleman with the peaky blinders cap was right to say our ambition should be to encourage more people to walk and uh, cycle. And we've got to think about how we design our city so more people can walk and cycle. Uh, what I've done, again, I'm not apologising for this, is invest in more now in walking and cycling than any previous mayor in the history of our city, and I'm proud of that. Uh, it's, uh, in the context of each year, more than 9,000 Londoners dying prematurely because of the poor quality air in our city. It's in the context of children having lungs that are underdeveloped because of the bad quality air in our city. And it's the context of the population of our city growing from 8.8 .8 million now to roughly speaking 9 million in 2020 and uh, 10 million in, 2030, in 2030. So unless we find more ways to move people around in, in an environmentally friendly manner uh, that's uh, less, destruct less destructive, we're gonna have problems. And that's why we're consulting, uh, as you suggested, in relation to uh, get, getting more people to uh, cycle. The first drafts of consultation are never perfect. That's why you consult. And I've been really impressed by the numbers of people who've responded to the consultation, saying, look, we're in favor of the principle, but you've got these details uh, wrong, as, as the gentleman uh, said. Particularly, it can't be right in the southern part of Chiswick High Street, for example, to have less pavement space, particularly when we want uh, people sitting outside enjoying the weather, enjoying some of the cafes uh, uh, that, that you benefit from in, in Chiswick uh, High Street. So what the Walking and Cycling Commissioner is doing Dr. Will Norman, who's here today, not simply visiting uh, Father Dunn and the uh, church, speaking to residents and uh, shopkeepers, uh, reading the responses to the consultation, more than 60% in favor of uh, CS9, but making sure we improve uh, the consultation uh, phase. So watch this space, uh, and I can promise you we will take on board some of your concerns, but I'm not gonna apologize for wanting to have more people cycle and more people uh, walk. It's really important uh, that we do so. In relation to the question asked by um, uh, uh, Samantha, in relation to uh, step-free uh, access, look, public transport should be what it says on the tin, which is transport for the public. And not all members of the public uh, are able-bodied. Uh, some of them have uh, uh, access issues uh, and have disabilities. Uh, some uh, uh, older people have issues in relation to getting around. Uh, some mums and dads with buggies have issues uh, getting around. Roughly speaking, uh, there are 270 underground stations across our city. About 20% are uh, 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 accessible to everyone. That can't be right. So uh, I've uh, uh, funded uh, the biggest increase in step-free access that the underground's ever seen. Uh, Osterley, which is uh, in zone in this area, will be step-free. The building works begin 2018. It should be step-free by 2019. Boston Manor uh, will be step-free uh, shortly uh, thereafter. But you're right. The focus has to be in the busy stations. You mentioned Zone 1 and uh, Zone 2. A number of stations in Zone 1 will be step-free very soon. Victoria has had work uh, done. Every single one of the Elizabeth Line 40 stations will be step-free. Uh, all our buses uh, are accessible to those who are disabled. 91% of our bus stops are accessible to those who are uh, disabled. And one of the things that Will is doing as the Walking and Cycling Commissioner is taking on board the concerns disabled people have around cycling. The previous mayor, had a cycling uh, commissioner, and that's all he did. But we've got to, as the gentleman said, you've got to have walking and cycling. You've got to, you can't have them versus us. And that's why Will's job is walking and cycling, thinking about how we design things, but also thinking about supporting small businesses. Because what we don't want to do is inadvertently, with the best of interest, uh, damage a small business uh, like yours. So please stay at the end, Will is here. Uh, please feel free to speak to Will. Uh, Will, do you want to stand up so as people know? Will is the good looking man with glasses. So, so our, we'll, we're, we're going to stay behind. Any particular issues, please raise them with us because we want to get this right. We want you to be in favour of the improvement in walking and cycling. Right. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I've told the Mayor previously that this particular matter of CS9 has exercised the people of Chiswick more than anything else in the past 18 years. Quite extraordinary the amount of controversy it has caused. Second lot of three questions, please. Is there anybody over there in the so sort of far corner beyond paddle? Do you know I can't even see the paddle behind, sort of right over there, right at the end behind paddle two, right at the end? That's the one. Hello there. I'd just like to question the uh, cycling issue again. You may have noticed all the cars that are parked in front gardens in, in the suburbs. What I'm interested in is how cycling can be made a viable option um, along the lines of the uh, what they call Santander bikes now. So we, we've got these bikes outside, which you probably tripped over on the way in, the orange and black ones. How can we incorporate that into the public transport system? Thank you. Can we have somebody in the middle block over here? There's a man also wearing a funny hat. It looks as though it's yellow and he's got a beard. I think. <laughs> yes? Okay. Is this, is this one? <laughs> um, my, my question is uh, on, uh, on transport. Um, my wife here, who is not well and uh, is a bit fragile, and there's lots of elderly people I see on buses. Uh, it's become very apparent to me since I've been uh, in this p position myself, traveling around with my wife. Um, some of the um, drivers of buses, um, they're not uh, so uh, aware, shall we say, about uh, elderly and frail people when they get on buses, particularly in the, uh, during the day. And uh, sometimes they brake too hard or they accelerate away too much, or the, and, the, and the journey is often fraught with that kind of experience and you, you become almost nauseous by the end of it. Um, so I think that there should be more, more awareness you know, with these drivers to make them aware of this. But there's a lot of elderly people out there. Um, also, when they come close to the bus stop, sometimes they're a foot and a half away from the pavement and, and like my wife here, she's trying to stretch and get over and she's almost falling over. And in even a, in a couple of instances, because she's a bit slow to get out, she's been trapped in the door. So I think this is a very important area to, to, uh, to highlight and understand. And as, as you know, there's more and more people like this trying to get around in the system. Yeah. And th this is a very, a, a, a really serious okay. issue, I believe. Okay, yeah? thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you. Somebody over here. <laughs> uh, they, it looks like somebody with white hair and uh, sitting at the end. You're right next to number eight, yes. I'd like to ask the mayor what he's going to do about the spiralling crime on a public transport system. And please don't give me any figures, Mr Mayor, because I know for a fact that TfL are stopping their staff from reporting actual incidents to try and minimise the problem. I have um, close friends and family who work on the system, the buses and the tubes and the trains, and since the closure of ticket offices and the nighttime tube, and the absence of platform staff, the situation is spiraling out of control. So I'd like the mayor to try and investigate it, perhaps set up his own team, bypassing TfL to get the real figures and deal with the problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, the, 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 the first question, uh, the, sorry, the, the first question asked by the gentleman at the, at the back in relation to Changing the culture in relation to uh, cycling, a really big question uh, you asked, and, and you're right. We've got to think about uh, how we live in our city, where people live, where people work, where people study, where people play. And you mentioned some of the dockless uh, uh, cycle, uh, cycle hire schemes uh, taking place. One of the things we've got to avoid happening is a free-for-all, where these uh, companies come in and they start leaving their bikes willy-nilly without due regard to space, without due regard to the consequences of bikes being left, or without due regard to residents like, like you and others who come, have cars and they want to come out of their uh, driveway. Uh, so what we're doing is we are coordinating with the councils. There are 33 councils in London, so that the councils reach an agreement with these private companies before they are, uh, have permission to have these dockless bikes. The advantage of the Santander scheme was we could work with them and the councils to have some coordination 
around where those cycle hire schemes uh, work. And so we need to get some coordination around these dockless bikes because you're right. If we're not careful, it can lead to all sorts of uh, problems. We've had examples of bikes just being dumped or them uh, clogging up pavements so people who are disabled can't get uh, past. And we're making progress uh, there. But the fundamental thing, though, is uh, what I've set out in my draft London plan. We've got to think about how a city develops. I, I answered an answer question from the gentleman about um, CS9. I made the point about the population of our city is growing. That means not only do you have to think about building more affordable homes, thinking about where people are going to get jobs uh, uh, and work to pay for living in London, but also how we get about our city, which means thinking about designing into developments places to lock up your bike, designing into shopping centres, new town halls, places to lock up your uh, bikes. It's really important we think about that uh, going forward. And if you get a chance, do look up the draft London plan on the website and see some of the plans we have there in relation to what the expectations are uh, going forward. Because you're right, we can't inadvertently, in a wish to encourage more people to cycle, leads to uh, chaos and uh, you know, sort of cluttering up of the pavement and of uh, town centres. The second question is a really important question. Uh, and actually, in my answer, I'm going to give you an example of how the assembly works so incredibly well. Uh, the London Assembly did a report uh, called Driven to Distraction. I, I look towards Caroline because she's raised this with me at a mayor's question time. Um, and so, so uh, this is an example of the Assembly looking at bus drivers. Uh, and at the same time, the Trade Union Unite did a report uh, as well. And uh, what they discovered was, um, for a variety of reasons, um, there's a disincentive for companies to be training bus drivers. There are pressures on bus drivers to get from A to B, which means you're right, sometimes passengers like your wife get uh, let down. Uh, and we've taken on board, I've taken on board as the mayor, some of the recommendations made by the assembly. And what I've done is uh, try to raise standards. So for example, for the first time ever, we have a license for London. So we're, we are saying to all privatized companies, if you're a bus driver in company one, and you leave and join company two, what happened in the past was, the bus company would reduce your wages, uh, they won't reward you for experience. And experienced drivers have been lost from our city. We're now providing a carrot uh, to these privatised companies to keep experienced dr bus drivers who will make sure they provide a good service to uh, uh, your wife and uh, others. And we've, we've got to make sure we carry on improving the uh, standards. That's why people sort of say to me, why are you investing money in loos for bus drivers, in toilets for bus drivers? The answer is, unless they've got toilets, they're rushing to get from A to B because they've not been to the loo for three hours. Mm -hmm. And so... We've got to invest in our public service, and that includes uh, bus drivers. And uh, you've given just a couple of examples of the consequences of corners being uh, cut. I want to turn it around and say, actually, one of the advantages of, uh, of having better training for bus drivers, of, teaching bus, of giving bus drivers dignity, it, was, it will improve the quality of life for a bus driver, but also the experience that passengers receive, like your wife. I'm not sure if uh, many people know this, but bus drivers are quite close to me. I'm not sure if you know what my dad did. <laughs> anyway, so, so, but, but watch this space and watch the improvements we're making in relation to this area. But thank you for raising this issue. It's really important. Uh, and we've noticed that quite a lot. We, we've also piloted announcements on buses as the bus moves on to make sure people just hold on tight because you, you're right, it, it is a big ish issue. The, the, the question from the back, Tony, raised uh, in relation to um, crime on public transport. I, I partially agree with you, uh, but with respect, sir, I think I, I disagree with part of what you said. Let me see what I mean by that. We, the taxpayer, are spending lots of London taxpayers' money in policing, and uh, we, fair payers, are spending lots of money by Transport for London paying for additional British Transport Police and additional policing in our public transport system. Uh, so it's not fair to say we're not investing uh, in relation to safety on uh, public transport buses, underground, trams, London Overground, and network rail as well. Where you're right to remind me, and I agree with you, is to remind me of the consequences of some of the ticket offices closing down and of there being less human beings uh, on platforms. And that's why one of the first things I did when I became mayor is ask an independent body, Travel Watch, to do a review saying, look, uh, the previous mayor closed down the ticket offices, got rid of lots of staff. What's your expert advice in relation to what we need on the underground? And uh, they said, I'm paraphrasing, uh, we need, roughly speaking, uh, 300 uh, staff. I've agreed to that, and we've got more than 300 additional staff who've joined since I became mayor on the underground. Roughly speaking, I think it's seven, 800 additional staff on the underground uh, system for the reasons you've said. It makes people feel safer. It deters uh, uh, crime. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is this, Tony. 
One of the things that we've done is to actually encourage people to report crime more on the underground, more on public transport. One of the big issues we've had is an underreporting of crime, particularly women and girls. Women and girls suffer horrible uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse on our public transport system. And uh, the phrase, the ca advertising is, report it to stop it. And that's encouraged more and more people to uh, report uh, harassment and abuse on, on, uh, on public transport. So I think it is unfair to suggest we're trying to massage the figures to keep them down. I want people to have confidence in the public transport system uh, and to report if they're the victims of crime or, or witness any crime in the public transport system. Thank you very much. And to wind up this section, Assembly Member Pigeon. Thank you very much. I'm Caroline Pigeon. I'm Deputy Chair of the Transport Committee and just want to respond to a few of the transport issues we've had. In terms of cycling, um, as a Transport Committee, we're very supportive of the cycling programmes. Um, but what we're concerned about is if we want to get more people cycling in outer London, we've got to start seeing some investment in there. Too often it's felt that some of the investment has just been in central London. And I think the dockless bikes are a very good example, as long as they don't clutter the pavements. But actually we've got to start building in parking um, and that means um, at stations to make it easier for people to get around and connect to the trains and network. It means storage on streets and that might sometimes mean taking away a car parking space but you can fit eight or ten bikes in that. We need to look at some of those those decisions going forward. But one of the things I'm concerned about is if more and more people want to cycle, actually sometimes you need a bit of refresher training. I know there's some excellent training that goes on out in the boroughs but I think we need to be pushing that more to link into new infrastructure that's going in to make sure people have the confidence to go out and use those use that that um, infrastructure one area we are concerned about is the mayor's got a very bold target but we want to see some interim targets going up to 2041 to really make sure that we're getting as many people cycling as possible um, the issue of buses that came up and bus drivers as the mayor said we did a huge piece of work on that um, last year and actually one of the things at the heart of this is how the contracts are set up with the bus companies at the moment means there's an incentive for them to keep to their timetable there are no safety incentives in that and that was one of our clear recommendations and I know the mayor's now agreed to an independent review of, of some of these issues that we raised and I really hope we start to see safety at the core of some of those contracts rather than just getting getting the bus there on time because people will take risks if that's what they're being measured against um, crime on public transport has been addressed I think one of the key issues for me is making sure stations in London are fully staffed from first to last train and that means where we have metro line services we have southwest railways out this way we have southern where I live and southeast and we want to make sure actually that transport for London run those metro services because then we're guaranteed to have fully staffed stations from first to last tr train and we've seen the huge success of that with the London overground and finally, I just want to touch on the accessibility point that was raised in the last one. Yes, step-free access is really important <coughs> for all the reasons given, but actually if we want our transport network to be fully accessible, that means making sure we have things like more audio announcements um, to help people around. We need to improve the signage um, for people with hearing problems. We need to pick up things like real-time information when a lift is out of order so that somebody who has got a mobility issue knows they can't don't get off at that station or find an alternative route. And some of these issues uh, really picked up by Transport for All, a very good disability campaigning charity in London. And I certainly went to a meeting recently and some very small changes they suggested would make a big difference to everyone who lives with a uh, different disability in London. Okay, thank you very much. I know there were many other people who wanted to ask questions on transport. At the end of the meeting in the foyer, there will be people who will take your question and ensure that you actually get an answer. Okay, we now go on to the next topic, which is on safety and that it does include policing and the fire brigade and once again I will take questions in threes I'll take questions in the far block beyond seven there aren't any I'll take this gentleman here who has a tattoo on his arm that's it in row six where six is I'm not a res my name is Tan, and I'm not a resident. I'm from Malaysia, actually. And I heard uh, Sadi Kant uh, talk a lot about um, international politics, and I think this is very relevant to safety, not just for London, but also for the whole world. 
So I'm not sure you heard about um, Ahok, who is uh, your counterpart in Indonesia. No, no it's we, we honestly, we want questions it's which are it's related it's to the safety of to ter London. terror attack and the crime rate. Yeah. So, so it's, this is relevant. This is the root cause of the problem we are facing today in the whole world. Yeah. Ahok, a governor w uh, with a minority ethnicity, was thrown into jail for insulting Quran. Yeah. In a Muslim country, and that's you did not speak up about that, and then you inst instead you made a statement about. Um, no, Terrorism attack no, no, is part no, and parcel no, no, of living no, in a big I'm city. Sorry, I, I'm There's sorry. a big problem. No, I'm sorry. This is I the root cause of the I'm crime. Not accepting this question. And there was this. That will do. Will Muslim, were, Muslim were raping. Him. Take his microphone from him. Take his microphone. Thank you so much. Sit down. Sit down, or you will have to leave. You will have to go. Would you escort that gentleman from the hall, please? Right. A uh, question from the block over there. Question from the block over there. There's a young man with a tie. Unusually, a young man with a tie. Yes, you. That's the one. Recently there, has been a rapid, recently, there has been a rapid increase on knife violence in London. Although conservative austerity is a factor, how can you make sure that when you receive those additional fundings, it is going towards effective crime policies that are helping the youth? Did you get that, Mr Mayor? Shall I yeah. repeat it? No, 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 we got, we got that one. Of course, this was an example. Hounslow is tolerant and open to absolutely everybody, including the man with a beard. Including the man with a beard standing up there with glasses next to a man with a very long beard. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, hi, good evening. My name is Shafiq, local resident. Uh, Mr. Mayor, your decision to change the policing model from 32, which is the current Mets uh, borough model, to 12, uh, which will be the new basic command unit model means in some cases up to three boroughs policing arrangements uh, will become one, as in the case of Merton, Richmond, and Wandsworth, and a few others. Bearing in mind that every borough has its own policing needs, are you not making it as if one size fits all and therefore compromising on the policing requirements of certain boroughs? Thank you. Okay, and we will take a Genuine third question from gentleman in the second row here. That's the one. Yeah. Hi there. My name is Mohammed Ali, and I'm a Hanzo citizen and a student at KCL. My question is regards to the knife crime as well. The question is why hasn't the knife crime <coughs> issue been approached in a more holistic way, such as a public health intervention? as this is more efficient, I think it's more efficient than the current enforcement methods. I also think that the enforcement method is not doing enough as those involved are from disadvantaged backgrounds and the sentences will not deter them from doing the crime as it's a cycle. And uh, tackling knife crime <coughs> in this way has, it, has already been, um, has already left a positive impact in Scotland. So why hasn't it been introduced in London? Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. So, so let me deal with the, the first question and the third question t together, because obviously they're uh, linked around uh, uh, knife crime. Uh, let me begin by um, uh, just saying that, that last week, uh, two more Londoners uh, were killed as a consequence of uh, knife crime, Sadiq Mohammed mm -hmm. and uh, Abdi Karim uh, Hassan, 17 years old and 20 year old in Camden. Mm -hmm. This year, uh, 16 Londoners have uh, lost <coughs> their lives as a consequence of uh, knives. Knife crime is going up across London, it's going up across the uh, country, and I think the gentleman, uh, Mohammed Ali, is absolutely right. We aren't going to solve the issue of knife crime just by enforcement. Um, it's got to be a holistic approach. What does that mean? 
it means we've got to be tough on knife crime. We do have to invest in the police. We do have to give them the resources they need and the support they need, and I'll come to that in a second. But also we've got to be tough on the causes. We've got to invest in young people. Uh, it, you can't say there's not a link between youth centres closing down. I'm not excusing criminality, by the way. Youth centres closing down, uh, cuts in education provisions, children's services losing their uh, 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 services, uh, the cuts you've seen over the last uh, few years, and young people, uh, uh, young people therefore having fewer constructive things to do, uh, and young people somehow thinking it's cool or uh, gives them respect to carry a, a knife. So we've got to invest in young people, and that's why in the budget I uh, announced last week, we announced uh, 45 million pounds for young people. Uh, Sean Berry, who's another member of the assembly who sits over there, did a report uh, last year. And what Sean's, I'm sorry, talk, talk, I mean, Sean will talk herself, but Sh what Sean's report showed was over the last eight years, uh, the number of youth centres closed down across London, uh, the number of youth places lost, uh, which means young people not going to youth centre, but hanging around street corners and doing things uh, that aren't sensible. So what I've invested also is in mental health facilities, because uh, obviously young people sometimes need support, particularly they've been the victims of uh, crime. And last week, uh, and a visit had been arranged for a while, the Commissioner of the Police and the Deputy Mayor for Police and Crime went to uh, Scotland to speak to the, the Violence Reduction Unit. And actually, we worked closely with them and many others uh, uh, as well. So we are invested in young people. We're invested in policing. Um, but what I'd say to you is this, both of you, um, this issue won't be solved by parents by themselves. They have a role to play. Big brothers, big sisters have a role to play. Uncles, aunties, uh, faith leaders, teachers, the media, politicians, the police, all of us have a role to play to make sure young people don't think it's somehow cool or okay to leave home with a, a knife. And we've got to turn this around because there are too many brief families in uh, London. The, the second question in the middle, Tony, uh, was in relation to Shafiq's question about the basic command units. And let me just explain to you the, 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 the rationale uh, behind uh, the basic command units. And it's very simple. The previous structure of 32 boroughs was designed for a Met Police service of 32,000 officers. And uh, that, that system uh, works when there are 32,000 police officers. We have lost over the last eight years 40%, 4-0, 40% of our budget in London with the police service. That's meant uh, that two-thirds of community support officers have lost their jobs. That's meant, uh, uh, that's about 4,000 uh, CSOs gone. That's meant a third of police staff losing their jobs, about 3,000 gone. That means, roughly speaking, 110 police stations and front counters closing down. That means 100 police buildings being sold off. So that old model simply doesn't work for 30,000 officers with fewer police staff, fewer community support officers. And so what we've moved towards is a basic command unit where we can have uh, people working closer together the detectives working closer together. It improves things like safeguarding. It means we can restore neighborhood uh, policing, but it is challenging. I'm not gonna uh, lie to you. Uh, it's challenging for the reasons you've alluded to. There are few people, uh, few you know, boroughs, 32. Each borough would have one borough commander. Now 12 basic uh, command units. So that's why I'm investing 110 million pounds in the uh, police service uh, uh, this year. But it's uh, a you know, tip in the ocean in relation to the cuts made over the last uh, seven, eight years. Okay. Assembly Member O'Connell. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I'm, I'm Steve O'Connell. I represent Croydon and Sutton on the London Assembly, and I chair the Assembly uh, Police and Crime Committee and delighted to be um, here tonight. So picking up first of all on the questions around knife violence, that to me and to many others is the number one issue in London today, as we've heard, we are losing far too many of our young people, and there are far too many young people prepared to leave home with a knife, be it uh, a knife they just take out of the kitchen sink, and prepared to settle their differences um, in ways of extreme violence. And this is unprecedented, and it needs to be addressed, and I agree completely with the sentiments already that it is a complex problem. We cannot arrest ourselves out of this issue, although, of course, we must use uh, all the force of the law against those who are prepared to and do commit acts of violence. It, there is the need of a holistic approach. Uh, in Croydon, we are one of the, unfortunately, one of the highest uh, boroughs 
with knife crime, we are losing also too many of our young people. So we do need uh, proper use of stop and search, and I think my, my, my colleague um, Sean is going to comment on that. We need that used properly and sensitively, and I think that's entirely appropriate. But as the Mayor says, there are reasons that young people are going out and doing violence at a very increasingly young age, and that is of the concern that, that, that we have. Those of 18, 19, and 20 are sadly probably lost to the system and need to be arrested and probably incarcerated. But the fact of the matter is that there are 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds prepared to do so. So it's an issue. And that is, that is the policy, I think, of the committee. Moving to um, the borough mergers, I think uh, this wonderful borough is going to be merged with Ealing and Hillingdon. I'm sure um, you will all have opinions um, around that. There are reasons for the mergers, not just around the resource issue that the Mayor has talked about. I think it's been an aspiration of the Met Police for some time to have a more strategic way of delivering um, their business. I think it is um, a necessity, but it is a high-risk necessity. Uh, and there's been all sorts of issues that have been highlighted by the committee yeah. ar around <laughs> consultation. We're going to find it difficult to get through all Around this. consultation. Uh, so I think, I think on borough mergers, we need to look at it very closely. And I'll be interested if people from Hounslow do write to our committee with their views around that. Okay, thank you very much. Assemblymember Berry. <clears throat> thank you, I'll be as good <laughs> as I can. Um, yes, the, the Mayor, um, to his credit, has listened um, to Assembly members over the past year. Um, when we uh, were standing, both standing for Mayor, um, young people already did see this coming. Um, there was a petition signed by 40,000 young people asking for reinvestment in youth services. They were really worried to see youth centres closing around them uh, and they asked us all to make a pledge to do something about that. One of the first things I did when I was elected um, after that was, was, was get the numbers and that's the report that um, the Mayor referred to. I asked all the councils what have you cut out of youth services and the number we got back was horrific. It was over £30 uh, million pounds since 2011 taken out of services for young people. Um, and even the police were saying, you can't keep pulling money out of public services and, and not expect to see consequences. So with the money that the mayor had um, from the business rates this year, um, he has put 45 million back in. Um, that's about one third of what's not been spent since 2011, but it, I think it'll make an absolutely huge difference. And, and you're right, the public health approach, uh, Mohammed, I can't see you anymore, um, is, is the correct one. It is what Scotland has, has done, and it looks at things <coughs> holistically. It builds up a strong society. It recognises that, that violence is something um, that will spread, that you need to be treating the causes, not just the symptoms. Um, and it is a different approach than what's currently in the mayor's knife crime strategy, but again, the Deputy Mayor for P Crime and Policing and Crime and the Mayor are listening really hard to people putting this forward now, and I think, I think we're seeing some improvements. So yeah, credit to the Mayor for listening. Um, we had the former Mayor in today in the Oversight Committee, and he kind of waved his hands around and said, what can you see that the Mayor has done? And I think the really um, important thing is, this is not something you can see. This is you know, youth centres all across the, the city, youth services, youth workers with jobs again, those aren't things that are visible, that have your name on it, Sadiq. Those are things that, that genuinely make a difference. So, well done. Thank you. Assemblymember Bailey. Hi, I'm, I'm Assemblymember Bailey. I'm a Conservative London-wide member. I'm credit where credit due. The Mayor did say he would try to do something about this, and he, he has. He's definitely looked at it. Um, his knife crime strategy, though, can do a few things a bit better, in my opinion. Um, Sean and I have a slight um, disagreement about where we put this new money for communities. I've been a youth worker for 26 years. Given a chance, I would ask the mayor to do something new. I think he needs to look at mental health more, more pointedly than youth work. If I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, I'd pick mental health. But on top of that, I would pick family support in all the different ways it can happen. Very few children behave for their youth worker. They absolutely will behave for their parents and their wider family if that context of around family support is brought properly. Also, family support has many, many more positive aspects into the future. I do accept the, the mayor is, is correct. We can't arrest our way out of this. That's not going to happen. But the mayor does control the police and to do a lot more about how they interact with everyone, particularly young people, particularly people from vulnerable communities. The mayor should actually be looking at how the police are trained. 
he should be doing something about how they're trained and how they try to build up the interaction with his new way that he's setting out um, how policing is laid out in London. So where I do support the mayor is that he has looked at it, there's no doubt in it, but I do think he should have a slightly different emphasis because we would get a long-term gain in many areas, not just violent crime, but also educational outcomes and the rest of it as well. And the key thing for us all, and it is for us all, is a cultural approach. Our children, and by children I mean young people, our young people, let me rephrase it, are far too willing to, to partake in very, very serious levels of violence. Acid attacks, moped attacks, knife, that is a cultural effect. The mayor cannot deal with that on his own. We all need to help. Thank you. <laughs> Take three more quick questions on this. Anybody at the back there? The middle? No? Let's have the guy that... I, it may be a lady. Second row in... Opposite number seven. Um, I would just like to say that we, I know that there's been awful children killed in all these knife crimes, but also that it affects ordinary people. I've had personal experience in my own home. I can't discuss it because of children, where we were lucky. My husband was stabbed, but he survived. Um, you know, Chiswick isn't just about... Um, the cycle superhighway or whatever, you know, the health of young people, the mental health which was involved in this case is absolutely important and children that are coming out of care need support in the community. It's absolutely vital. We live with it every day. As a mum, I've had to be strong for my family, my children. Um, it isn't just about gang culture. There's a lot more to it than that. And I support um, what is being done, but, and I thank the police and the emergency services for what they did for our family. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> There's a man wearing, again, a peaky, looks like a Peaky Blinders hat, right at the back there, near number three. Hello, Mayor Sadiq Khan. My name is Ali Ahmed. Um, I go to the College of Law in Bloomsbury at Tottenham Court Road. And there's never been a day where I've seen people on the streets sleeping throughout the night. Um, there hasn't been a day where I've seen many, many people just off the strip of Tottenham Court Road station sleeping, looking, you know, flabbergasted. And it shocks me, saddens me, and I generally feel horrified to see people on the street like that. Today, it was snowing and I saw people on mattresses covered in snow, um, noses, pale, they were, you know, they couldn't stand. So what is the mayor doing about um, not only homeless people, but homeless people within the cities and within people who are living in different areas of London. Um, I understand today on social media there was a viral message that went out, especially due to the weather, where there's been um, sort of local authorities intervening in the situation and helping uh, I'm sure the people. mayor will tell you what, what, yeah. what he's doing on that. Is oh. there a, another question uh, right at the back? I, well, it looks like... Um, Chief, and I'm the member of Youth Parliament for Hounslow. Um, you've promised £45 million to youth services in London over the next few years, Mr Mayor. Um, yeah, <coughs> none of this is going to local authorities, despite um, the huge cuts they've had to make due to austerity. Why is that? Okay. Right. So, Christina, good question. Th thank you for your question. It is. They can, they, can, they can bid for it. So it's £45 million. Pounds, it's £15 million over the next three years. Uh, and councils can bid for it. Youth centres can bid for it. If you want to set up a youth venture, you can bid for it. So it's no, it's, nobody's excluded from bidding for it. Schools can bid for it. They want to provide more after-schools, uh, clubs and stuff as well. It's, uh, it's the, the stuff that, sh that Sean and Sean were talking about is being innovative, trying new things, and that's what we're doing. So they can bid for it if they want to bid for providing facilities for uh, young people. But just to remind ourselves, the report that Sean did and the work she's done, even though we're investing this money, it's new money, it won't meet the money we've lost over the last few years, but it's still better than nothing. 
The question, can I just deal with the, the, the issue raised by the lady, uh, the very brave lady um, in, in blue in relation to being the victim of uh, violent crime? Um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge facing our police, 40% of the issues the police face every day in London have a mental health element in it. Uh, for a variety of reasons, because of cuts made over various years, uh, care in the community is not really working. Um, 300 calls a day are from somebody with mental health uh, issues. And um, that's one of the reasons why uh, we're investing this year and every year going onwards in uh, a sum of money, uh, 3.3 million pounds, so that the police can make sure there are mental health experts to do with people who are unwell to get them freed up to do proper policing with uh, criminals and stuff. It is a big issue. Joanne McCartney, my deputy mayor, just reminded me that we're also training teachers to spot and identify mental health issues so they can, in, in the classroom, help here. And we're also doing some work with CAMS to make sure we can offer better facilities for young people across uh, London. I just want to remind all of us, in London today, uh, there are one out of three of us, one out of three of us has a mental health issue. Uh, just look around this room. And so we've got to make sure we reach out and help those who have mental health issues uh, uh, to make sure it doesn't spiral into criminality with the consequences that you alluded to. Ali, thank you for your question in relation to rough sleeping. Um, we are probably the fifth richest city in the world. That, that just underscores the, the shame in relation to the issue of rough sleeping in London. Uh, there are roughly speaking 8,000 rough sleepers in our city, Ali, 8,000. It doubled uh, from 2008 up until uh, uh, now. What we've done this year, even before the cold weather, is to change the rules in relation to shelters. The rules used to be they needed to be zero degrees or colder for three nights in a row before the shelters would uh, open up. I discovered this last year. It's, it doesn't make sense to me. And so uh, we, we, before the bad weather, we said, listen, if the weather approaches anywhere near zero degrees, open the shelters up. All the 33 boroughs, to give them credit, are all signed up to this. And we've also employed more outreach workers because some people are vulnerable. They may have mental health issues. They may have drug issues, alcohol issues. They may not like authority. They won't come in. We're going to have outreach workers to go out and speak to them and communicate with them. Uh, some uh, rough sleepers, because they've got a dog, wrongly think they won't be accepted into a shelter or a place of uh, warmth. Last night, my deputy mayor for housing, James Murray, and I visited um, a severe weather uh, emergency provision shelter in Hammersmith. And it was both uh, depressing and inspiring, the work taking place there. Inspiring because of these workers working through the night to help rough sleepers. Depressing because we know for every one person we're helping, there are six, seven, eight not being helped uh, out on the uh, streets in temperatures that are really, really uh, uh, cold. Let me show you some of the things we're doing. Uh, uh, so we're making sure we identify people before they become rough sleepers. More outreach, was, outreach workers working tonight and over the course of the next few nights. We've given monies to allow the shelters to book B&Bs if need be. Some people won't want to go into a shelter, but they'll take a B&B. &B. We're giving them flexibility to uh, do so. The other thing I'm encouraging all of you to do if you've got a, a, a phone is there's a, an app called Street Link. Street Link. If you see somebody sleeping rough, just type in the app. Please give us the location of this person. That, that app goes to an outreach worker who then goes to the person and makes sure they're okay uh, and provides an offer of some shelter during the course of the night. We've also got a page to donate to get more and more people uh, helped uh, uh, this year. Uh, you know, uh, we all saw in the news a couple of weeks ago a rough sleeper lost his life in Westminster Tube in the fifth richest city uh, in the world, and Ali, it's a big issue and big priority uh, uh, for us, and, and I'm inspired by the people I met last night, but it's a tragedy I I in our city, and so we've got to make sure we redouble our efforts uh, in this uh, area. Okay, thank you very much. We now uh, are out of time on safety. I repeat, any unanswered questions, speak to someone in the foyer after the meeting. Uh, the next topic is air quality and the environment. Questions over there? There's a man in the middle here waving a program. That's it, question four. We've got him. Don't question that. Good evening. Um, my name is Rupert Wiley. I live in Isleworth, um, close enough to the A4 and under the 
Heathrow approach. Um, I gather, unless I'm mistaken, that the GLA is uh, generally opposed to Heathrow expansion. Um, I was hoping to ask this under the transport section, so you'll have to sort of mould this question. But on, would anybody like to comment, or Sadiq particularly, about how the mitigation might or might not work with regards to the extra, whether it be the 700 extra flights a day or the massive increase in surface access, which, as we know, the budget isn't there. There's potentially 10 billion shortfall. Um, maybe you'll comment on that, even though it's not strictly to do with the environment and, uh, and air quality. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Lady in the brown cardigan. This is, um, I'm Nicola Redpresser, and I'm um, from a group called Air Quality Brentford, a community group. Um, we believe that stopping the ultra-low emission zone before the North Circular will confound the existing problem of poor air quality in our area. And um, with vehicles using the North Circular to avoid being charged, we believe that Brentford and actually the whole of Greater London should be included in the ultra-low emission zone. Um, or Brentford needs to meet, be made a clean air zone. It feels like we are being overlooked. Can you assure us that additional measures will be taken to clean up our, our seriously toxic air? I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> <coughs> Over there, there is, there is a lady, I think she's got glasses, and her hand is right up there. Yes, that's the one. Um, I represent Heston and Heston Forum and Burns Wayne and Shelley Crescent Group. And my question is on pollution and the build up of roads, particularly traffic concerning Henley's Roundabout. It's a very highly polluted area. We've had, and um, we'd like TFL and something done about it, please. Uh, I can do all, all three of those questions in, in order, um, Tony. So, so, Rupert, thank you for your question. It definitely is uh, an air quality environment uh, uh, question. Uh, and you look, when you look in, uh, in this part of London, um, uh, the, the main cause for the nitrogen dioxide and the nitrogen oxide to be so high is uh, road transport and Heathrow Airport. They're the two biggest uh, causes. And let me tell you a really scary uh, stat which is the particulate matters in London, across the whole of London, breaches the WHO guidelines. So no part of London has particulate matter that's within the limits of WHO guidelines. That's now, before Heathrow is expanded. And let me just be clear, Rupert, here. I'm not anti-Heathrow. What I'm anti is expansion of Heathrow. <coughs> and it's very important that this not, is not perceived as being anti-Heathrow. Lots, lots of people here work in Heathrow, and they do a great job. My concern is expansion. And if you think air quality is bad now, what's it going to be like in the future? What's it going to be like with more surface links going from other parts of uh, London and the country to uh, Heathrow? And if Heathrow break promises now, how do we have any guarantee that they're going to keep the promises they're making in relation to meeting the air quality uh, needs? And what about noise? I mean, noise is also a real uh, cause of quality of life issues for people in this part of uh, London. In Wandsworth, uh, where, I live, it, where, where I live, it's an issue uh, there. I know it's an issue uh, here uh, uh, as well. Now, let me tell you my concern. This is where Heathrow have been very naughty and other government. All the improvements we're making because of City Hall, ultra-low emission zone, cleaning up our buses, more people walking and cycling, all these things are being bagged by Heathrow to say, oh, look, the air's getting better in London which means we can have another runway uh, in uh, Heathrow, uh, 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 and that's not a problem. And they're sort of having their cake and eating it. And that's why it's really important that we put pressure on the government. Uh, Tony, I know, has been very, very vociferous and vocal about his views about expansion of uh, Heathrow. A number of councils uh, have a court case in the pipelines, I understand. Um, and City Hall uh, are, are, are against uh, an expansion that leads to poor quality air and a poor quality of life for people here, but also affects other parts of London and the other parts of the country uh, as well. Uh, and the second question, which is linked with this actually about air quality, is from uh, Nicola. Uh, can I just say, the pressure you're trying to put on me is the right sort of pressure. 
Because if we were speaking two, three years ago, people would be complaining about us, about me bringing forward an ultra low emission zone, about me trying to get rid of toxic air from some of our uh, cars. So I like the sort of pressure you're bringing to bear upon me and to uh, City Hall. Let me just remind colleagues what our plans are. Uh, we've already have the world's first uh, toxicity charge applying in London. That's the C charge area. So if you have a very polluting car, basically a, a car that's older than uh, 2004, uh, it's a, a polluting car, uh, diesel, uh, uh, you have to pay an additional charge to come within the C charge area. And we've noticed a huge reduction in the number of polluting cars coming into the C charge area. The good news is these same cars probably drive around Brentford and Hounslow and Isleworth, and they're not being used anymore thanks to the T charge. By the way, not all of us here were in favour of the T charge. Some of here, people here, were anti good air, were anti clean air. Uh, the good news is uh, we defeated them. Uh, we're now planning to have an ultra low emissions zone, the world's first in 2019 covering the C charge area. Uh, and what that will mean is, don't forget, the, the, the quality will no longer be what's called Euro 4, it will now be Euro 6. So we're raising the bar. So in 2019, if you want to come into central London, the C charge area, you've got to have a really good car, a Euro 6 car. Roughly speaking, if it's diesel, 2015 or, on, or, or newer. If it's petrol, roughly speaking, 2008 uh, uh, onwards. Those cars, though, will also be driven in Brentford, in Hounslow, in Isleworth, and all the rest of it. So it will improve the quality of air in central London, but also improve the quality elsewhere. In, uh, I'm not sure what some of these people think about that one, but we'll have to wait and see. In 2020, all of London will have the ULES for buses, coaches, and lorries. The reason we've not done it overnight is because it's not fair for a fleet to have new hurdles placed upon them. And so we're giving them time to buy cleaner forms of buses, coaches, and lorries. And that's 2020, all of London, including this part of uh, London. We're consulting <coughs> what happens in relation to uh, cars, motorbikes, and other vehicles. Uh, and the current consultation is from 2021 up to the North Circular, and up to the South Circular. But if you've got different views, please let us have your views, and there's a genuine consultation. But don't, don't, be, um, don't worry that if it's just going to the North Circular or South Circular, you won't benefit. All the evidence is that actually it will lead to behaviour change, which means all of us benefit from cleaner vehicles being, being used across London. And that's in addition to the, the, the issues around encouraging more people to walk and cycle. Uh, uh, we've stopped buying any more diesel buses now. They've got to be hybrid, uh, hydrogen, or uh, electric, and we're making sure uh, that we're using public transport in a, in a sensible, environmentally friendly uh, way. Uh, the question about the roundabout, I, I don't know the details, but if you uh, come to the front at the end, uh, in the front row here, my staff are here, and they'll take your details down, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll follow you up. We'll take your email, and we'll follow up the issue you're raising. Is that okay? Please, yeah. yeah. Well, don't, don't, don't give me the whole note tonight. G give us your email and phone number, <laughs> and that, that my cycling and walking commissioner uh, we'll take your details and I promise we'll, we'll chase you. We'll ch okay. Are there any questions near panel number five over in that corner? We don't seem to have taken any. Is there anybody near number five or number three? Look, now you're nowhere near number five or number three. I'm seeking to... Somebody near number four. Go for it. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor, for... <clears throat> the much you are trying to handle the pollution in, in London. But this pollution normally comes, I have a, members of my family who have <coughs> asthma, and normally it becomes severe because of so many roadworks which are not finished in time, which brings up, building up, it builds up actually the traffic causing a lot of pollution. And this road is not only one, so many roads linked to one another, and the work is not finished, the traffic build up, the pollution increase, and we have a problem with that. It seems as if, it seems as if the work, road works is not planned properly. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm looking for questions really at the back of the hall where there hasn't been a lot of excitement or interest. Uh, is that lady who's standing up asking a question right at the back? No, you're not. Well, it looks as though it's the chatty people down the front. Now, there's a man with a beard near number eight. Hi, um, I was listening to your C-charge, um, uh, helping 
for keeping cars outside of London, but in particular, do you have any incentives for people who live in flats and want electric cars? Because um, I was looking to get one, but I didn't know how to charge it, and there's not enough charging platforms around, I would say, especially in Hanslow, but I've seen it a lot in London, central London. Thank Cheers, thank you. <laughs> there is somebody at the back. Yes, uh, number four is at the end of the corridor. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, well, I'm a new Londoner here. So, well, uh, this city is uh, really huge in not just the matter of pollution because it's the main thing. But I think that when I came here, I'm getting deaf <laughs> because the brakes of the buses are really, really noisy and I can't help every day walking around the city. It's like, uh, it's extremely noisy, I'm getting deaf all the time and please, <laughs> if you can do something to, to avoid it, I'm really, really, uh, I don't know how to say it, happy. Thank you very much. Well, you've got a chance to make someone happy, Mr. Mayor. Th thank you. F f f firstly, the, 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 the gentleman in, in, in this suit at, at the back, um, you're right. Uh, when it comes to road works, they're not properly coordinated. <coughs> uh, there are too many uh, roads dug up. Uh, uh, so one road could be dug up today by this, by this company, British Gas, for argument's sake. That same road, six months later, dug up by... Thames Water. Yeah. A year later, dug up by BT. Yeah. And the obvious question is, why can't they coordinate, do the works at one time, and all three at the same time use the opportunity to lay, lay their pipes or put in the, uh, the, uh, the fibre optics and all the rest of it? We have powers in relation to fines and issue permits, but it's, it's not enough of a deterrent. So we've lobbied the government to give us more powers in relation to uh, this area. We do take action against those companies that take too long, they should be doing it much quicker, and we do take action and, give them, and issue them fines. But now we're lobbying for more powers so we can have a real um, uh, uh, device to put pressure on these companies so they don't dig up our roads and cause all sorts of uh, problems. Why can't, for example, uh, if a road is being rerouted and work's not being done, that, route, that road be opened up, you plate the road so cars can go over it and stuff. So we're looking into this, because you're right. Road work causes congestion, congestion causes uh, uh, bad quality air, so we actually, it helps the issue of air quality. So watch this space. We're gonna try and uh, rectify this issue because it is a big, big uh, issue. Uh, th the second issue in relation to charging was a really, really important point, which is, look, um, it's possible to have a car uh, and the car doesn't emit toxic stuff. Uh, electric car is, is one uh, uh, way of doing so. Not everyone has a drive to charge their cars. And so what we're doing is uh, helping councils have uh, charging points, Hounslow, has recently had 13 uh, installed because of a, a partnership between us and Hounslow using lampposts and using other forms of charging points. What we need, though, is rapid charging points across London because what you can't do is leave your car plugged in overnight if, it, if, you, if you're in a flat. And so uh, the good news is we've gone from almost zero to now 75 rapid charging points across London. They take half an hour to charge rather than seven, eight, nine hours, half an hour you can charge your uh, car. And we need across London to have facilities for people with electric cars to charge their uh, vehicles. We're working with the 33 boroughs, because they own the land often, They're using lampposts uh, and other things to try and uh, have charging points. Also, see, thinking about we can have forecourts, like we have petrol forecourts, why can't we have charging forecourts going forward in the future and stuff? Uh, because that's the future. The future is making sure we make it uh, uh, you know, attractive someone like you to want to buy an electric car because you can charge a vehicle even though you live in a, a, in a flat. And so we're making progress in this area. At the moment, there are 3,000 charging points across London. We want there to be even more across uh, London, including in, in outer London as well, because it can't just be in London where there are charging points. The, the third question in relation to the noise um, uh, and your concerns about your, your hearing and, and stuff it is an issue in London. It's an issue particularly in relation to noisy tubes, noisy trains. The underground can be really noisy. Uh, it's a concern for our staff who work in the underground in relation to uh, noise uh, as well. We are trying to do things to reduce noise. For example, on the trains, we're grinding the tracks and making sure there are better brakes to make less noise when it comes to the underground. In relation to traffic, 
uh, you're right, there are simple things you can do to make braking less uh, uh, noisy. Nobody's actually complained to me in the past about our buses being too loud, but let me look into the issue of whether we can uh, have an audit of our buses to see whether there is an issue, because I worry about our drivers, because our drivers are in the bus all day long. And if it is the cause, that, if it is the case that they're too, too noisy, we can look into that. But let me, I, mean, I, I'm, I don't pretend I'm the world's expert on noise and our buses, but let me go away and look into that, and then, Tony, report back to you, and you can then, via usual channels, report back to your constituents. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, as I say, any unanswered questions will be dealt with afterwards. Uh, the next section is housing. Housing questions. Ah, we've got a bit more interest in this one. <laughs> Um, there's a man, a man over there who's smiling very cheerily. Hello, um, Mayor and the Assembly, thank you for um, coming tonight. Um, I'm Jay, I'm a young um, working Londoner, um, I live locally. Um, I also work for a housing association locally called RHP. Um, personally and professionally, I know the housing issues facing young young Londoners and um, getting on the property ladder is a dream. Um, at RHP, we've developed a product that addresses this issue. Um, a, firstly, please, please, Sadiq, come and see it in Teddington, in Richmond. Um, B, in areas where shared ownership um, and even London living rent is unaffordable for young people, what is your solution for working young Londoners to find sustainable housing solutions? And there's an even cheerier man sitting next to you. That, that, that man. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Assembly members. Uh, Mr. Khan, I've been reading the draft of your new uh, London plan, which is currently in its consultation phase. I was extremely alarmed to read this requires 25,000 homes a year to be built on small sites. This would allow the building of blocks of flats on existing family homes and gardens. What will be the impact of this policy on suburbs such as Hounslow, and how many gardens will be lost as a result of this policy? <laughs> There's a, somebody near paddle number five at the back there. That's it. Yeah, um, my question actually um, touches on homelessness as well as young people as well. My name is Adeleke Adiemi and I've worked within the homelessness sector as well as um, managed youth projects in the past. And um, Sean mentioned you know, one, or two, one thing there in terms of um, um, working with families to address um, young people issues. You know, one of the things I wanted to raise here tonight was you know, there's a lot of money that's been pumped into the housing sector. The mayor mentioned that there's 50,000 homes that's being built every year. And actually, there's meant to be, as I believe, about up to 200,000 homes that need to be built every year. Um, in terms of the flux of m people coming into the UK to live, you know, so whilst we think of that, there are a lot of homeless people, you know, who are losing out, losing out on uh, on supported housing, as well as you know the numbers of homelessness yeah, will be rising as a result. What's the question? What, well, the question is, you know, what is the mayor going to do in terms of working with developers to actually identify um, within their schemes, within their development? Um, allocation of supported housing or some sort of schemes that actually supports young people, supports families, and actually, you know, bridges that gap of homelessness. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Th th thank you for all those uh, <laughs> three questions. Jay, firstly, uh, don't go away at the end. Uh, make sure you speak to James Murray. James, you want to stand up? So, so James is the Deputy Mayor for Housing, and we'll arrange for one of us to come to Teddington uh, to come and see uh, RH uh, uh, P. But just to remind you, in relation to young people uh, and uh, being able to afford to live in uh, London, the previous definition of an affordable home was a home that's 80% of market rent. So it was linked to the market rent of a property rather than the earnings or income of a young person. I've thrown that definition in the bin. My definition of an affordable home is one of three things, either a home that's a council rent, and that's linked, as you know, to a manual worker's salary, or it's a home that's a London living rent, that's a third of average local earnings. 
So the London living rent in Hounslow will be different to the London living rent in Camden. And the third definition is a shared ownership, part by part uh, uh, rent. And so we are trying to address this issue. We're also working with innovative de developers. Pocket is one example to see if we can make sure that we can do some work in relation to those affordable homes. Tom Copley, who's here, who's, who's behind me, has done some work in relation to making sure corners aren't cut in relation to providing affordable homes uh, in relation to micro homes. And I'm sure Tom will want to come in in relation to uh, that uh, shortly. In relation to the question asked uh, by the gentleman next to you, uh, it, it, and let me just answer you in, in a very straightforward way. The government says, the government says, we need to build every year in London 72,000 homes, 72,000, government says. Each year, in, on average in London, we build not 72,000, 25,000. Now, if it is the case that we think we shouldn't be building on Greenbelt, and I think we shouldn't be building on Greenbelt, we've got to make sure we use brownfield sites, former factories, industrial sites, in a more savvy way, but also make sure we have good quality, high density homes where there is space. Let me give you some examples of where small sites can be used for homes. Transport for London. We have surplus small sites next to stations, and we've identified between now and 2021 uh, space for 10,000 new homes. What I'm not saying is that uh, I will build a home in your back garden. Uh, I'm not seeing how big it is, by the way. Uh, if it's big enough, we'll have a chat afterwards. I'm not joking. <laughs> what I am saying is we've got to make sure we use small sites in a sensible uh, manner. At the moment, by the way, you can build in your back garden. There's no need for planning permission. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, where there are small sites, uh, there could be a, a, a small office building uh, where the person is not used for office building anymore. Work with the council, work with us to turn that into high density, good quality homes for uh, Londoners. And that, we're gonna go from 25,000, approaching the government's uh, target of 72,000. We think we found enough land in London for about 65,000 uh, homes. But if you think you've got a way of getting to 70,000 without building a green belt, speak to James Murray, we'll be happy to hear your ideas. Uh, the third question for the man at the back is so important, which is the fact that one size fits all won't work. We've got an older population. Because of the fantastic advances in science, people are living older. Uh, we want them living in their own homes rather than living uh, elsewhere uh, in residential care homes if possible, but also people need supported housing. And what the draft London plan does, sir, is make sure we encourage developers to not have a one size fits all approach. We're talking to all sorts of developers. We're talking to developers in relation to uh, housing associations, small one and big ones. We're speaking to private developers. We're speaking to the NHS. One of the real exciting things we've managed to negotiate from the government, and the government deserves credit for this, is devolution around uh, surplus NHS land in London. Not simply to make sure we can afford to build homes for NHS workers, but think about how we can have uh, homes uh, for people who need supported housing. Think about how we can make it easy for people to live in their uh, homes. And so that's what the Draft London Plan uh, does uh, going forward. And we are talking to developers all the time to make sure we meet the needs of uh, London's housing. So I remember Bailey. <clears throat> um, the Mayor's analysis of our need for homes in London is accurate. We all know how expensive it is and how utterly impossible it is, particularly if you're young, to get a housing ladder. But it has to be said that the, the proposed the Draft London Plan does make it easier to build on small sites. And it's been, a, it's been a worry for a number of people. I, I'm sitting here now looking at a letter that's been, pro been provided by a developer asking people if they want to sell because he knows you can build on the footprint of their house, including their garden, and get on. And if you add to that as well, that it looks like to me that the plan also makes it slightly harder to build on small industrial sites. Brownfield sites is, is the term we use. So it looks like it's taking away what we imagined we were going to build on and giving back something that we imagine we don't want to build on. I mean... Maybe the, the mayor sees it slightly differently, and but the advent of these letters, and there's been a number of them around London, particularly in the suburbs, is now beginning to people, people are beginning to think it's a war on the suburbs. And why that's important that that feeling doesn't grow is because the suburbs will be providing a great deal of the housing, but if councils and local communities feel that they're being, um, densities being foisted upon them, they'll start to deny, they'll start to um, push back and not accept these building projects, and then we won't have places to house our children. Because the important thing here is, it looks like we could lose some of the family homes we already have and not replace them with family homes because the target for family homes has been removed. And that will make London a very, very bad place. If you have any idea that you want to raise a family in London, make raising a family in London virtually impossible. Assembly Member Copley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony. 
Um, I think one of the uh, crucial things that the mayor is doing that is going to help young Londoners is the London living rent policy. Uh, and this is a new tenure which is uh, being based uh, not on percentages of market rents like this 80% so-called affordable rent, but on um, based on people's earnings. And this is particularly going to benefit people like nurses uh, and teachers and paramedics. What we what we we've sort of termed te you to term key workers, the people that London really needs uh, to keep going and who wouldn't qualify for social housing, but who can't afford uh, to buy a house and, and possibly can't even afford shared ownership uh, either, and really are being pushed out uh, of this city. But ultimately, and this, this is the reason why you know, we have this huge figure now of 66,000 homes a year that need to be built, by the way, 65% of which need to be genuinely affordable. The reason why that number is so high is because for 30 plus years, we've not been building the homes that we need, and we've not been building the affordable homes that we need. And that in a big part is because the, the states, the government, local government, well, local government has been forced out, essentially, of the business of providing council housing. And the mayor has secured 3.15 billion over five years for genuinely affordable housing in London, including some of these London living rent homes. But we actually need something like that figure every year from the government if we're going to get up to the level that we need. And that will benefit everyone, including young working Londoners. And I just want to say something finally, because it, it was raised earlier about, about rough sleeping and homelessness. And of course, homelessness is, is rough sleeping is really the most visible and most tragic uh, sign of, of uh, homelessness. But there are hundreds of thousands of people in London who are in temporary accommodation or who are hidden homeless. Um, and the mayor has a number of policies in relation to rough sleeping, I think 30 million pounds for rough sleeping services, 50 million for move on accommodation, the no night sleeping rough task force. But this is swimming against the tide and we need action from national government. It is national government policies that have increased homelessness, even according to the National Audit Office that don't usually get very political about these things. They have said this. The biggest cause of homelessness is now the end of a private tenancy. So we urgently need, and this is stuff that goes beyond, the, unfortunately, the mayor's ability, uh, the mayor's powers. We need the government to change its policy uh, on welfare and on cuts and on caps and to increase, in, introduce more security for people living in the private rented sector. <laughs> Near number five, we have two people waving their programmes. Are you together? Just one of you. Hello, I'm Richard Griffiths, the chairman of Hammoth Park House. Um, I'm also a resident of Hammoth Park. Uh, Hammoth Park House is a Grade Two listed historic house, and it's on Historic England's Register of National Importance. It falls within Hammoth and the Feltham area. It's the home of London's first air park. The community are campaigning, campaigning to save it and to restore two levels to include a museum, a CAF, an education, education centre youth clubs, wedding venues, arts and crafts, and much more. New housing is planned to enable the funds to save Hammoth Park House for generations to come. Will you support the community in this? And lastly, would you like to visit Hammoth Park House to meet the friends of Hammoth Park House and to see what the special community benefits are? Also, lastly, I'd just like to say thank you to our wonderful MP, Seema, who has been to the house twice <laughs> and has, has helped us with the open days. And that's it. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you very much. We have a <laughs> young people there. The, the young man who's standing up, sort of. That's the one. <laughs> um, hello, uh, my name is Yusuf Chand, and I'm a resident of Hamslow. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to ask how my generation are going to afford houses in London with the surge in house prices in the recent years. This is unaffordable for the average person living and working in London. Us Londoners are being driven out of the city, and I don't want to live somewhere five miles away from London. So I want to know what you're going to do about it to help us stay in London. <laughs> Woman with the star. Hi, I'm Rivuji Bhuvan in Hounslow Citizen. I would like to ask a question. Do you know how many people are from Rivuji and migrant communities are homeless? What are being done support for them? How, uh, how are specific needs that arise from trauma taken into account? How are you supporting elderly refugees and migrants? Thank you. 
Sometimes my pronunciation, I didn't understand. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's a question on how are you supporting refugees and migrants for housing? Thank you. Can I firstly deal with the question from Richard? Can I say, Richard, I completely agree with you. Seema is wonderful. <laughs> She's a great MP. <laughs> so, look, so, so I want to ask my other Deputy Mayor, Jules Pipe, to stand up. Jules, you want to stand up? So, so Jules, can you come and speak to Jules afterwards? We'll arrange for someone to come down and see <coughs> the fantastic work taking place. And, and, uh, and heritage is very important to our London plan. And so speak to Jules afterwards, and we'll liaise with Seema about the, the, the work taking place at uh, Hamworth. Yusuf, let me tell you um, something that I'm well aware of as the, uh, the, the father of two wonderful teenage daughters, which is uh, the evidence is by 2030, by 2030, one out of three... 30-year-olds, one out of three, will be living with their mum and dad because they can't afford to move out home. Now, I love my daughters, but at some stage, they've got to leave. So this is an issue that's really personal to me in relation to making sure we have genuinely affordable homes for young Londoners to be able to afford to live in. And Tom, in his, in his answer, actually summarised some of the challenges we have, which is, look... We need to make sure we're building far more genuinely affordable homes that our young people need. Our population is 8.8 .8 million. By 2020, 9 million. By 2030, 10 million. Growth per se is not a problem, but lack of planning for the growth is a problem. And so for those people that say, don't build on brownfield sites, for those people that say, we shouldn't be using the small sites to build homes on, I say, where are you going to build these homes? Where you build genuinely affordable homes for our young people? And so that's why I've redefined the definition of an affordable home. I'm not going to be somebody who says 80% of market value is affordable, but I'm going to take on those people who say we shouldn't be building on small sites. We shouldn't be building on brownfield sites. We shouldn't be having a, a conversation about how people get to work, get to college, and they walk more and they cycle more. Um, but it is a challenge. And what I don't want, though, Yusuf, is people like you leaving this great city. This city gave many of us here on stage the chance to fulfill our potential. It gave us the helping hand. It is the, it is the greatest city in the world. We don't want to lose talent like you to other cities around the country or around the world. It's in our interest to make sure there isn't a brain drain and we keep the brains in uh, London. Um, the question about the refugees is a really important question. So just, just, just to give you an idea of, of the, the challenge we have, um, I talked to when Ali asked the question about the rough sleepers. I, uh, James and I were at a rough sleepers uh, shelter last night and there's a phrase they used which uh, is relevant. It is no recourse to public funds. And one of the challenges even good councils like Hounslow have and many other good councils across London have is often they're presented with uh, somebody who's a rough sleeper who's homeless. And because of their uncertain immigration status, and they haven't got recourse to public funds and there's not a lot the council can do. Councils have faced 40% worth of cuts over the last seven, eight years. They are struggling to provide the basic services, let alone the services for those who have no recourse to public uh, funds. It is a challenge. In City Hall, we're supporting charities as much as we can. We're doing work around refugees, particularly uh, for those women who are the victims of, uh, of domestic violence and, and uh, issues around uh, London who need uh, housing. Uh, we've got a strategy coming out very soon that will help uh, women and girls in uh, London. And we're supporting where we can, in, in a, a small way, those uh, organizations that help uh, refugees across our city. But I'm not gonna pretend, uh, I'm afraid, that we've got the resources to provide the assistance uh, that refugees uh, need. And i just end by saying this point. One of the reasons why we are the greatest city in the world is we provide a refuge for those fleeing persecution and seeking asylum. And we should be really proud of our history as a place that provides uh, asylum and safe refuge for these people. And it is an outrage, the fact that we have in 2018 children who aren't being given a refuge in uh, London. Promise safe refuge, these are Syrian children, uh, in 2018 still not being given that refuge. And I think you should be proud of the assembly members here who are united in our call on the government saying it's a disgrace. They should do much more to help these vulnerable children. <coughs> And we now come to the uh, final section, which is on growing London's economy. Questions, please? Woman at the back with glasses, close to number seven, closer to number eight. Hello there. Uh, my name's Sam Smith. Uh, <laughs> since, 20, 
<laughs> Since 2013, central government has progressively introduced legislation to allow the conversion of offices, industrial and shops to flats without formal planning permission or contribution to local infrastructure. Are you concerned about the impact that this is having on London's economy and jobs and what are you doing to combat <coughs> this? Question from a lady down here. Uh, hi, my name is Unsa Chowdhury and I'm from Isleworth. So my question kind of focuses on transport, economy, but also housing in a way. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, let's stick with the economy, please. So yeah, we've got the Golden Mile in Brentford and Austin Spring Grove. There is a t old um, TFL line there, so the old South Hall to Brentford. Would you consider reopening it and helping us to bring some economy to this part of West London? Okay. So someone near paddle number one. Well, hand waving in the air, a lady waving her hand. Um, as a young feminist and a fellow con, uh, <laughs> um, I've seen you post a lot about women's rights on social media. You support the uh, Behind Every Great City and Our Time Now campaigns. However, I want to question what you're actually doing to change the current inequalities faced by working women in London, London's economy today. Oh, Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned the word economy. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, so the question about the first question about permitted development is a really important question. The idea was probably a good one, which is to make it easier for office blocks to be turned to residential, bearing in mind we have a housing crisis. What it's led to is poor, poor quality housing uh, in parts of uh, London, not enough, nowhere near enough affordable housing, and landowners making massive, massive uh, profits at the same time we've lost precious and valuable workspace. And so uh, what we're trying to do is to help councils protect these areas in London by helping them have what's called Article 4 directions to protect these offices being turned into poor quality uh, housing. What we'd rather do is work with uh, landowners, work with uh, councils. You can have mixed uh, office and uh, residential developments. The draft London plan talks about this, particularly in town centres. Uh, it's possible to have, for example, ground floor shops and offices, but you can have going upwards uh, residential uh, developments. And so I think permitted development hasn't been good for uh, London. And we're looking to put pressure on the government to make it work far better for our city. Because my concern is this. Once something's been lost to a PD, to residential, it's an opportunity lost forever. And that's why it's really important to get involved early with these uh, sites to make sure we get good quality housing that's, that we desperately need. And it's got to be good quality affordable housing for our city. Uh, Unza, thank you for your uh, question and for having the foresight to think about the link between uh, infrastructure and transport and the economy. Because actually, having good infrastructure and good transport leads to good economy. So we're doing some work in relation to the West London Orbital and doing some work around this line and, and, use, and bringing back into use some of this uh, direct uh, line. Why don't I suggest, Tony, that, I, that I'll let Seema, the MP, have the details about this and you can contact Seema or my office and we'll let you know some of the progress in this. It's quite exciting in relation to bringing back and use current lines not used well to try and regenerate the area, particularly if we can connect town centres in West London and elsewhere uh, as well. And just think about if we've got Crossrail 1, which opens uh, towards the end of this year, next year. Hopefully we'll have Crossrail 2 as well, but also we can connect town centres with some of these direct lines being reused uh, as well. Add to the equation, uh, over the course of the next three, four years, We'll have even better bus services in outer London as we reduce inner London services because of Elizabeth Line. I think it's quite exciting for e the economy in the west of uh, London. Uh, and I I'm not sure if the last questioner was saying uh, that we're both Khans and we're both young as well. Uh, I'm hoping she was saying uh, we're both young uh, and we're both Khans <laughs> and we're both feminists. The first thing you could do uh, is this Sunday in Trafalgar Square, we're going to have a really amazing event. Uh, Helen Pankhurst, who's the granddaughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, uh, we're going we're gonna to rewalk the walk from Parliament Square to Trafalgar Square. And then in that great square, there'll be a number of great speakers talking about uh, why it's important 
to address the issue of gender inequality and to have gender equality. And if you remember from your history books, the suffragette movement and the suffragist movements, Trafalgar Square was really important in relation to lobbying politicians to change the law and to finally, as Jeanette said, give some women the right to vote 100 years ago and then more women uh, 10 years uh, later. A number of things we're doing in City Hall. Uh, we published last year the first ever gender pay audit. Never before had City Hall done this. Why is it important? Because I want you to know uh, the salaries of men and women uh, and to realize there's a pay gap. Then what we've done is we've had now got a, an action plan to reduce that pay gap. Why is it uh, that uh, there is a gender pay gap? The answer basically is in the senior positions, there are more blokes than women. Well, we've got to address that. It's not the case, by the way, that there aren't enough talented women. Don't, let, don't, don't for one second uh, accept that's the, assume that's the uh, case. What I say to people when they say there aren't enough talented women is you aren't looking hard enough and you mix with the wrong people. And we should be really proud that for the first time ever, the most senior police officer in the country, the commissioner of the Met Police, she's a woman. We should be really proud for the first time ever, the most senior firefighter, the commissioner for the London Fire Brigade, she's a woman. And there are other steps we're taking across uh, our city uh, as well. We want to make sure, for example, every young person realises, uh, particularly if they're a girl, there is no career out of their reach. Yesterday, I announced uh, £7 million worth of sum for a digital tech pipeline, particularly targeted towards uh, girls, uh, young women, and uh, ethnic minority communities, those in deprived communities as well. And uh, what Behind Every Great City is about is not simply commemorating the progress made over the last 100 years, but also redoubling our efforts to uh, have gender equality. Because it's still the case in London in 2018, if you're born a girl, your life chances are less than if you're born a boy. And we are the most progressive city in the world. That can't be right. Paddle, paddle number eight. <coughs> I think you, it's really very hard to see, but I think you've got someone there. Oh, I can't see it. Yeah. Salam this is, my name is Najib Ahmed. I'm a prevent coordinator, essentially, for Hounslow. But it's more uh, a, a question on business. Um, what, you, what is the Mayor's Office prepared to do to grow London's economy in the light of the increasingly and greatly escalating business rates that are going to be applied to businesses across London um, and the stifling impact that they, that's going to have on the businesses that we all want to run. <coughs> is there another person near number eight? What is it? It's completely invisible to me, I'm afraid. No. Right, near number seven. Well, it looks like the lady there. I'll come to you. I'm on my way. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is obviously um, that um, Mr. Mayor has touched on the digital uh, technology uh, slightly, sort of. Uh, it's going to become the key issue and the key, sort of, if you can say, for the next generation. How are we going to bring that into the next generation that people actually are? more into the artificial intelligence, they are aware of it, they are educated on it. What are the plans and the policies around that from uh, our government? Thank you. Right, who yelled out over there? That woman, with the that woman I'm told, that woman with the... the to yes, it looks like the lady nearest the paddle, number one. Okay. Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. Give me a five of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm with the Hounslow West team and um, this is a, a question just not about also about economy but the services and facilities for our residents here in Hounslow. Mr Mayor, I'm a resident in Hounslow West area and along with thousands of other residents in the local community, we are greatly concerned about current proposals put forward by A2 Dominion for the former Morrison site. We urgently want to see a larger supermarket on the site, which we understand would be commercially viable. And for more, more car parking for residents and customers, our local councillors strongly support us. Our local MP, Seema Maholtra, has also written about this to your Deputy Mayor for Housing. 
We do not feel our issues have been listened to and the lack of a large supermarket in walking distance has made life much harder for local people. Will you comment to look at our concerns as part of the stage two referral? Mr. Mayor. So, <coughs> let me do all those questions. I mean, firstly, to the, 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 the question about small businesses in particular and, and business rates. There has been a massive hike, uh, you know, last year, and the transitional relief uh, didn't really help small businesses. By the way, Heathrow got a business rates reduction, uh, uh, with fascinating uh, anomaly in relation to what happens with the current uh, regime. We're doing a number of things to help small businesses uh, in this area. So, we've set aside a sum of money to help businesses in relation to workspace, in relation to transport, in relation to infrastructure. It's 140 million pounds we've set aside to help businesses grow in uh, London, particularly because we're concerned about the consequences of uh, Brexit, if it's, if it's an extreme hard uh, Brexit. Separately, we're also help businesses who want to grow, particularly small businesses. We've got a good growth hub. And so contact, if you want to contact City Hall, we've got a team there, and Jules Pipe is the mayor in charge of this, deputy mayor in charge of this, which is a, a team uh, set up uh, with, with the London Enterprise panel that the LEAP uh, helping small businesses grow and flourish and uh, thrive and do uh, better. Some of it is doing deals in Europe. Some of it is supporting you with expansion. Some of it is helping you with scale-up and stuff. So do contact City Hall about what we can do to help your business uh, scale up as well. The bad news, there will be another business rate uh, valuation in the next two, three years' time. And so I'm afraid uh, the, this is not the end of the business rates uh, uh, pain. And what we need is more certainty for small businesses uh, going uh, forward. The, the second question is such a fascinating question, which is how do we realize that uh, technology is an opportunity, not something to be scared of, uh, with AI, with automation, with robotics? And I genuinely believe that actually our future as a city and as a country is in high-skilled, well-paid jobs, not low-skilled, badly-paid uh, jobs. And technology is one way to do so. But that means skilling up our youngsters to have the skills for these jobs of tomorrow. We've got to invest in young people when it comes to coding or programming or to be tech savvy. That's why I announced this sum of money yesterday uh, of seven million pounds. And particularly, we've got to reach those groups who currently aren't using tech. Why is it, when you go to uh, great tech companies, there are far, far, far for men, uh, far more men than there are women. Why do so few girls do coding? Uh, and so we're working with big companies from Google to Apple uh, to small and medium-sized companies to make sure we train up our youngsters to have the skills for the jobs of tomorrow. But also, you know, we aren't too old to retrain. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, I speak as one. Um, and so we've got to make sure we have an ethos of continuing professional development. All of us should realize the job for life is gone. The idea where you'd get a job at 21 and have that job until you're 70, that's gone now. You'll retrain throughout the course of your life. Sometimes it's saying to an employer, you have a duty of care on your employees to train them up. Uh, but also it means us at City Hall. Uh, and from 2019, we'll be taking over further education. And we're doing some work around how we can think about training up uh, Londoners going forward. A, a career service, that's for everyone. Uh, those sorts of things are really, really Im important. We've really got to think about this as an opportunity, uh, not, not to, to be uh, uh, scared of. And the question from, from Hounslow uh, uh, West, uh, you're right to remind me uh, that uh, this decision will come to me as a planning decision. Uh, and that means I, I, sort of, I sort of sit like a judge. What I can't do is uh, give you my views before I've considered the case. That's, that's called prejudging the outcome when there's a quasi-judicial uh, uh, function. Well, all I would say, uh, though, is that it's really important uh, that if there's any retailer that wants to have a new uh, retail development on the former Morrison's uh, site, they, they come forward. The council will decide the application based upon its merits, but to be fair to the council, the council's job isn't to be a retail provider. What they are doing is that they decide whether something gets permission or not, and they can try and encourage uh, retailers to come to the area and try to have a mixed development with housing, and uh, a retail, but we need, it could be Morrison's, it could be somebody else to come forward with a plan, and then for the council to, to consider the merits of that plan, and I'll consider it as, as the, the mayor, uh, on quasi-digital terms, whether it deserves to get permission or, or not going forward. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Well, we've now come to the end of the evening. As I say, for any questions unanswered, there will be an opportunity to give uh, your questions to staff 
uh, in the foyer. May I thank you all for coming and for being such a tolerant audience, and may I wish you a very safe journey home. Thank you very much.